Hi, I'm Matt Turk, and today my guest is Florian Dueto, CEO of Didaiku. Our company is trying to democratize AI for the enterprise. We were uh, 230 million of AI back then, and we have more than 1,000 employees. Didaiku is the leading enterprise AI platform targeting global 2000 companies, used by hundreds of customers around the world, and most recently valued at 3.7 billion. We were honored to be uh, last year both AI and ML partner for the year for uh, Databricks, Snowflake, AWS. We go into all sorts of things from the reality of AI today in the enterprise. We could have like clicked on a button and like spent maybe not 100k, but like 20 or 30k before realizing it was like completely stupid. To emerging use cases for generative AI. 2024 will be the year where we see way more use cases in production and seeing some uh, durable, real use cases associated to generative AI. This episode was recorded live at a recent Data Driven NYC, the monthly in-person meetup we've been running for over 10 years now, hosted by our friends at Foursquare at their beautiful headquarters. Enjoy my conversation with Florian. So our company is trying to democratize AI for the enterprise, building a platform to make it simple to prep your data, to build your models, and then move them in production. So it's, it's a platform that we provide, focusing quite a bit on a large enterprise, um, to share with you some numbers. Uh, we, we are still private, so we share numbers only. Uh, when we need or want to. And last time we shared numbers was last September. And back then we crossed uh, 600 customers. We were uh, 230 million of IRR back then. And we have more than 1,000 employees. So we focus quite a bit on medium to large enterprise, uh, helping them uh, essentially make uh, AI models uh, in production, prep the data, like getting all of these boring things uh, required in order to get value out of data. A lot of people seem to think that 2024 is going to be the year when AI becomes real in the enterprise. From your perspective, from the ground, what, what is the state of readiness uh, of, uh, let's call it, global 2000 companies for AI in general and generative AI in particular? I would say that we, we well, it's probably need to be a differentiated answer compared to AI in general, and generative AI and non-generative AI. So first, I think we should all have a common name for non-generative AI, call it conventional AI, non-AI, traditional AI, I don't know. I, tabular. Tabular AI, but it's not only tabular. Like, if you get to the specific, like if you, uh, if you get to a specific use case, like uh, getting the images of raster for a microchip company and predict the quality control, it is traditional AI, it's non-generative AI, but it's deep learning. So is it generative AI or not? Uh -huh. We don't know. That, that's, well, that's the issue. But so I would say that um, from my perspective, at least, there is, well, the maturity of AI as in having a predictive model in production in the enterprise has grown significantly in the last 10 years. Um, I see multiple customers having hundreds of models of production and being happy with it. I would say it was not the case 10 years ago. And I think there was some maturity in terms of moving analytics to the cloud, in terms of uh, understanding how to manage the cost of machine learning, uh, how to distribute and give access to the data more broadly. And so not every enterprise is there, but there have been some progress. And it's, it's a continuum in terms of progress that I've seen in the last 10 years. Um, generative AI, I would say that for the enterprise, and here I'm talking very specifically of enterprise leveraging generative AI for their own internal kind of use cases, building their own generative AI solutions. I would say that it's a mixed situation where most enterprises are, are testing stuff, are doing some proof of concepts and so forth, but I've seen only, so we've got about 100 customers that uh, use our platform for some LLM associated use cases. And we've seen some use cases in production, but it's not the majority yet. And I suspect that indeed 2024 will be the year where uh, we see way more use cases in production and seeing some uh, durable, real use cases associated to generative AI for enterprise use cases. I think it's, it's really interesting and it's sort of poorly understood, which is the, the those two different families of, of AI. So traditional tabular, columnar, structured data, uh, AI versus generative AI. So what is what is that first category? What, what does it do? How is it different? What kind of data does it operate on? And most importantly, what are the specific use cases versus generative AI? What does generative AI do? 
and what are its use cases. It's possibly obvious, or not to the audience here, but indeed today in the enterprise, most large enterprises would have quite a bit of machine learning in production, leveraging traditional AI in order to manage use cases, ranging from uh, predicting the churn of your customers, segmenting them, targeting them, understanding affinity of your product with customers to recommend your product, and or uh, do dynamic pricing, optimize the quality control of your assembly lines, manage supply and demand, and all of those use cases, and it's becoming fairly common. Why is it fairly common? Because it's doable now, and that's the best way to actually optimize your business, especially when you reach a certain size as, a, as an organization. So this is mature in the sense of in each industry, you would have the major player of such industry having done and implemented uh, traditional AI in production, and that's all the economy is working these days. So AI is already uh, making this work. So I mean, you, probably the electricity in this building is uh, provided with not AI per se, but there is indeed some AI model, uh, machine learning models involved into uh, predicting stuff associated to the production itself. That's almost sure. That's how it works. And on the other side of the spectrum, generative AI, which is how AIs get to be known by the general public, which is fun for us if you're a practitioner, like you've got AI as you know it, and now someone else is coming and giving another definition of AI, and your grandmother is talking about AI. Uh, I think for us that generative AI might be this uh, additional layer on top of uh, traditional AI, ripping and adding more benefit to it, more automation, and lots of uh, promises there. But yeah, it's the early innings of it. And different use cases, or even the use cases are not completely clear in the enterprise. Most important use cases are, the, are not fully scoped yet, but there is a mix of use cases that are brand new, use cases that are uh, not as, uh, associated at all with, uh, with tabular data, which are about uh, finding information, very much about documents and so forth. And you've got also many use cases that we see that are just, uh, let's say, natural extension to uh, uh, existing traditional use cases. As in, um, if you already have in production some uh, product recommender system, one uh, issue with the last mile is that if you start having some sophistication there with like multiple products to push to someone with a limited channel, maybe your last mile of personalization is not so obvious. If it's advertising, it's like, how do you craft the content as a display? If it's email, like, what is the content? If it's text, like, how do you actually craft uh, a text message pushing for two products uh, that would be personalized enough? And, and so this kind of last mile is now, can be done now with generative AI. And we could not do that before because uh, human time to actually personalize the content was not realistic. Meaning if you have two unrelated products and you want to craft a very small text message which is very personalized per the profile and demographic of the individual, like you don't have time to do all of those combinations and make them very personalized, and now you can. You, you actually can. But in order to do so, you still need traditional AI because if you don't have a product recommender system, it, it would not work. So in that case, uh, generative AI is providing this last mile, this additional benefit in terms of traditional AI, the last mile of, let's say, personalization, for instance, the last mile of accessibility in other contexts, and in other situations, it's like brand new use cases, indeed. What do you tell Global 2000 large enterprises when they come to you and ask, generative AI sounds amazing, how do I get started? I think that, if I'm intellectually honest, we have so many people as telling them, uh, so much information that I'm trying to, to focus on one aspect that I truly believe in, because scoping use cases is a job of already too many people on the planet, from my perspective. And so I'm focusing on one thing, which is um, back to basics. Um, well, you must be aware that you need some ROI to your use cases. Good, you're not stupid, so I'm not telling you that. Uh, but you must be aware that probably because of the evolution of technologies and LM out there, it's very likely that you will have to switch from one provider to the other over the course of your application if your application is successful. Or if your application is not successful, well, we don't care about it, of course. But like, if you plan to run it for like one or two years, it's very probable that you'll switch from OpenAI today to uh, Anthropic tomorrow, and maybe Mistral, they're French, uh, on Friday, and maybe you will have to, uh, for this or that country, if you really deploy it, um, Globally, you might have to self-host on an open source model because of whatever regulation. So what do you think about this complexity moving forward? 
And what do you think about overall the state of uh, your company when you don't have like one application in production, but like 5, 10, 20, 50, 100? Because it's actually fairly realistic for an enterprise to have hundreds of generative AI applications in production at some point. More talking about this aspect of things. One of the moving pieces in the generative AI landscape is the question of cost. Mm -hmm. What do you tell companies, and especially when they tell you that they're concerned about wasting money on generative AI investments? Well, first I'll tell them that it's true, they might waste money. That's just a fact. And so the, the, the way from my perspective to approach it is pretty basic. Today, um, you may have multiple providers, multiple applications, some of them are in dev, in prod, and the issue with generative AI is also that you may have unforeseen cost when moving to production because you don't anticipate the size of the context you're pushing at, you don't anticipate some user behaviors and so forth, so you need some actual monitoring of cost and attribution towards users and apps. And so my first step is telling them you actually need to have a gateway between your application and your LLMs in order to track all of the costs and understand before moving things to production how much you can anticipate in terms of cost. Real life scenarios is that even us internally, at some point we build some internal use cases associated to uh, um, sales calls or what else, and we realize that the running cost would be like 100K. I was like, 100K? No, no way. No way we're doing that. We have to optimize this and that. But like, indeed, without having some control, we could have like click on a button and like spend maybe not 100K, but like 20 or 30K before realizing it was like completely stupid. And I think that it does happen quite a bit on the market right now. If you fast forward to a world where you move those LLM application in production, managing the cost is indeed, it's a bit boring, but it's, it's just one requirement, uh, especially when we move from, the, from a, a state where we focus on like the easy, obvious applications that are reaping lots of benefits to multiple applications with, for which the ROI might be more uncertain than one. What are the other blockers you see to enterprise adoption? The cost could be one, um, defining the use case could be one. Are you seeing things around skills? We don't have the people internally or governance or data transparency. The first layer of concern associated to, um, to security, uh, to uh, putting guardrails to your application, understanding what are the risks associated to that, uh, leakage of information, a lot of those things. And I think they are uh, solution to that, but it requires some discipline. Potentially, one of the roadblocks is indeed around uh, skills, ease of use, and ultimately uh, making things work. Because if we're, again, uh, a bit honest, it's not that easy to make a um, generative AI application work in practice. Uh, we are playing a little bit dark science there, where you uh, get your LLM, you fine tune, you rag your stuff around, and you decide, like, uh, okay, good, see size of context, checking yes or no, this way or not, and it works, and you're like, oh, yeah, it's like cooking, like, it, it ended up working, and, and you stop, <laughs> because, like, once it's good, like, it's like a sauce, you, you stop cooking, you're just like, yeah, I'm good. So it, it looks like that, really, in real life these days. So from my experience of these type of fields, it's very realistic that six months or one year forward, we will look at us now and we'll be like, okay, they were playing a bit with new technologies and maybe we will have like more sophisticated way to do things that will work better. But today indeed, it's a bit of, um, there is a part of uh, experimentation there. It's part of the roadblock. I think it's important for many enterprises to do so because that's how you innovate. That's how you will learn faster than others. That's all you will actually maybe get one year or two years ahead in terms of adoption of AI. But indeed, it's not, it's a bit of a risky business because not everything is working. And so us as the Taiku, we are working on making things simpler for the enterprise, but we just have to be realistic on the fact that like not everything is working today in terms of making LLM the next generation of things doing everything in an enterprise. It's not just, it's not magic yet. So my big takeaway is that uh, building generative AI is a little bit like the movie Ratatouille. That's that's the that's general idea. Yeah, Ratatouille. Yeah. So let, let's talk about Didaiku and the platform itself. Mm. Platform is very broad, does lots of different things. Maybe give us a product tour of what it does from data prep to AI. We've added LLM um, and AI, cap Gen AI capabilities recently. So of course, they are the most exciting one. And it's like connecting to the various LLM out there, doing content engineering, 
and uh, easy uh, no-code UI to build your app. So that's um, all fine, and I think I, I talked about it uh, um, already quite a bit. But so uh, a lot of the interesting aspect of our uh, platform is we decided to build one platform where you could do data prep and all of the data engineering very well, but in a way that can be uh, ac very accessible by the business, so that business can be independent in terms of doing data prep, and to build a platform where you can also do auto ML at scale, auto ML and ML ops. The vision is to have in one platform the full end-to-end -end life cycle of data as it should be. As in you connect, you prep, you build your models, you test them, you have all of the back tests there, you move it to production, you can visualize step, things at every step, and you can life cycle all of that. Just because I do believe as a practitioner that it's easier to do it this way than having multiple different tools or different uh, teams or stages responsible for that. And the other thing of the platform and is I do believe that there is a need to make this more accessible towards non-technologists, as in non-nerds, meaning people that don't love doing Python. And I say that, loving doing Python, but also getting old, so I do know that I'm a very bad coder today. And so I sympathize with like everyone that actually needs and have some domain expertise, but won't get into code anytime soon even with Copilot or whatsoever, and that still need to leverage their data in order to get things done. I think there is a, this gap that we are uh, fulfilling in the market in terms of providing this platform uh, for the enterprise. And by the way, any lessons learned building this over the many last many years um, about what it takes to, to build a product which serves different kind of audiences because you have an audience that's data analyst, an audience that's much more technical, and then you're doing the full life cycle. Um, had, 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 yeah, lessons learned building product. One of the lessons was the lessons of clarity because it's not an obvious bet because in theory you should focus on one aspect of data and just do the best product at it. But my own take, which was to some extent very personal, is that data is a plumbing problem where most of the time you waste is connecting things from one step to the other. And so that consequently there is more value by helping people do each step, but like consistently, so that you have one platform where you can get everything done. And this bet, for instance, was from a product design perspective, a bit controversial indeed. But nonetheless, we made it and it led us to make some compromise because indeed you can't be the best platform at everything while doing everything at the same time. I would say it's a controversial product bet to do so. So the big launch of 2023 was the LLM Mesh, which is your generative AI initiative. Do you want to talk about what it is, what does that do, and uh, where that fits in the overall picture? Some of this audience would be familiar with Data Mesh. Okay, so why not LLM Mesh? Hmm? Why not? So, because really, if you think about the enterprise, fast forward a few months, if not a few years, I think that most enterprises will leverage multiple LLMs coming from multiple vendors. You will have large ones, small ones, so technically you should not call them LLMs, but whatever, easier for everyone. Uh, you would have some that would be fine-tuned, you would have some virtual LLMs where you have some RAG, and so they became an LLM augmented with some knowledge or information, and so you have to manage all of those LLMs together, and ideally, you, you would want any kind of application from your uh, company to be able to tap into any of those LLMs with some flexibility. So having proper routing there. Virtualization layer for that, the same as a data mesh, is a contract or virtualization layer uh, for data. And so talking about contract, it means that uh, you need to add some uh, uh, security or condition there in order to help them move to production. And then the ideas are, can you add a universal layer to ensure uh, privacy? Filtering, uh, to ensure content filtering, to ensure cost control. Given that privacy, content control, and cost are the things that are today the most variable from one LLM to the other. And so if you want to virtualize them, you need to be able to have uh, basic guarantees in terms of making sure they don't uh, go crazy, either in terms of cost or in terms of content they push to uh, the outside. And you have multiple partners in the LLM mesh. Okay. Do you want to mention a few? Yeah, so we, we built uh, this in order to essentially integrate with all of the uh, vendors on the market, integrating with Yuging Face, AWS Bedrock, OpenAI, and uh, uh, Google uh, Gemini, of course, Anthropic, 
and uh, AI21 labs, uh, also with uh, vector databases that can provide a wrap for virtual LLMs, such as Pinecone, for instance, um, as, a local, uh, as a local vendor, but also, of course, uh, Lama, Lama Index. And so all of this uh, being an ecosystem of partners uh, and of the vendors that our uh, customers are using in order to build uh, Gen AI um, applications. So the way it would work is um, I um, use Pinecone for my vector database to bring in my data. I can bring any of the uh, large language model vendors and then did I would provide the governance and orchestration layer. Exactly. And if you want to switch vector database or LLMs between your uh, open source ones, your local ones, or uh, from one vendor to the other, it's more like a drop down when doing prompt engineering, easily test from one to the other. These kind of things that are important for the enterprise when moving things to production, we see quite a bit of uh, usage patterns where people would start uh, GPT-4 for uh, design and then decide to move to uh, essentially something cheaper, uh, cheaper like uh, uh, Mistral self-hosted or Mistral self-hosted uh, when moving to production. And so I think that we, you have to help uh, this kind of usage patterns. How does architecture evolve to the earlier part of the discussion between traditional AI and generative AI? Uh, did you end up with a hybrid kind of um, architecture where, where a generative model would call a predictive analytics model in some kind of chain, or do they remain somewhat separate for the foreseeable future? When you build the models, or especially the RAG models, there are pretty much there are lots of integration because when of the, let's say, data analytic part and the uh, generative AI part, because indeed a big problem when doing an actual RAG is that you need actual data and you need to clean your data and so forth in order to have the relevant data to, to use. And so at the end of the day, you've got big, still big data pipelines, uh, which can involve some uh, traditional AI nets. And then you've got applications such as personalization or recommender system type of applications where you kind of like mix a traditional AI, a product recommender system providing the basic inputs that then feeds into the generative AI layer to generate the output. And so in that sense, you, you chain them. What does a enterprise AI motion look like for Global 2000? companies? Is there a part of education and services that's involved or is the market sort of mature in buying? How does it work for the Daiku? Uh, well, from my perspective on the traditional side, it's a fairly mature market where uh, a lot of the movement is uh, associated to the, like, the modernization of analytics, which is from my perspective a big movement of analytics requiring to move to larger data sets, moving to the cloud, more sophistication involving more ML than before or more sophisticated ML techniques. And so it's all about moving from the desktop to the cloud with more stuff. And so we are part of this movement where typically our customers would also set up um, cloud data warehouses or data lake, such as Snowflake and Databricks. And we would be a layer on top, helping all the overall orchestration and ease of use by the business. That's a big movement we see on the market. And from my perspective, this movement is, uh, let's say, fairly natural. On the Gen AI side, it's, I would say, today more uh, consultative oriented because many companies are still figuring out the scoping, the cost, don't have the resources or the bandwidth to do so. And speaking of uh, Databricks and Snowflake, talk about your partnership strategy. Last year was a big year for Dataiku on that front as well. You won three key awards in the space. Yeah, we were honored to be uh, last year both AI and ML partner for the year for uh, Databricks, uh, Snowflake, and AWS, uh, which is great, meaning we can work with everyone, Snowflake, Databricks, AWS, and so forth. We, our focus is actually indeed those enabling a broader user base in the enterprise to get faster there, like get faster to let's uh, stop, just do my own things on my laptop with my old tools and move to the cloud, get more sophisticated faster, which is complementary to, well, and actually generating consumption and uh, a faster drive for the cloud platforms uh, below us. I really like this um, conversation uh, we had around the, you know, building a platform and we, we talked about it from a product perspective, but from an entrepreneurial perspective, you know, the, the common wisdom that, uh, you know, VCs like me say is that you, you need to be a, a, a tool before you become a platform, meaning you need a wedge uh, 
and, and to get to product market fit. And then over time, you add functionality and then you end up being a platform. Whereas did I cool back in the day in 2013 at its creation, started as a platform. Do you think that was a moment in time because you were early to the industry? Uh, or is it still possible to be a platform first as a startup? I think it's really a matter of vocabulary. Do, do you think that VC can be a tool or should be a platform day one? As, as a, v a VC, a VC, VC, yeah. a VC uh, we, we, we certainly have a reputation for being tools. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. And so, the, again, on our side, it was really about like, focusing on like, what is the problem at end. The, the way I see it, enterprise need to see uh, analytic pipelines, ML pipelines, and their apps as assets themselves, like IP assets they have to manage over the course of one, two, five, ten years. And so previously those assets were like not considered as assets, more like programs done by some people you don't talk to on their laptop, but like become, because they are becoming more important, they really need to be managed. And so if you want to be the platform managing them, you need to have the ambition fairly early on to be kind of like end-to-end -end there, and being a platform. I think specific to a market where there was this uh, kind of like disruption of the life cycle. Florian, thank you so much. Really appreciate it.